Well, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. My name is Eliza Canty Jones. I work with the Oregon Historical Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program Black Abolitionists and Mercantile Frontiers, A.H. Francis and His Circle, 1835 to 1864. Uh, we're so uh, grateful for this program to be partnered once again with Oregon Black Pioneers. Uh, Oregon Black Pioneers is Oregon's only historical society dedicated to preserving and presenting the experience of African Americans statewide. The organization has been around since 1993. They have researched and documented and educated the public uh, about the many people of African descent here in Oregon all across the state. And if you're not already uh, following Oregon Black Pioneer, signed up for their newsletter, following them on social media and supporting their work, we encourage you to do so today. We know so much about Oregon history because of their work and we're really grateful for their longtime partnership with the Oregon Historical Society. We wanna begin our program by taking some time to acknowledge uh, that we're on stolen land here in Oregon and wherever you are really in the Americas, you are on indigenous land. Uh, I am speaking to you today from Portland, which is located on the lands of the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. And we take this time to encourage folks to think about the history of the indigenous peoples who've lived here and had relationships with this place since time immemorial, to recognize that those people continue to live here and have those relationships, and to think about the uh, histories of, of trauma and violence that have led to the survivance and resilience of those people today. So we really uh, encourage you all to take some time to learn about that history uh, and give respect to those peoples. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce today's speakers. And I do also wanna let you know about another special event that's happening this weekend that's connected to the history you're going to hear about today. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, Saturday, September 8th uh, at 4 p.m., the Lang Syne Society and Oregon Black Pioneers will dedicate a plaque honoring A.H. Francis, who you're going to learn about today. The ceremony will begin at four o'clock at the site of Francis's mercantile store. Uh, which the, the intersection is now Southwest NATO and Harvey Milk Street. And at Francis's time, it was Southwest Front Avenue and Stark Street. So the public is invited to join that plaque dedication. Uh, and we've seen some pictures of the plaque. It's up and ready to go. So we think it'll be a really great event to mark on the landscape, the history that you're going to learn about today. I'll introduce our two speakers. And then we invite folks to uh, engage in the chat or the Q&A to add your questions and that kind of thing. After the presentations, we'll have some time for question, for Q&A. Also, this program is being recorded and it will be put up on the Oregon Historical Society's website within the next two weeks or so. So you'll be able to continue to access it and share it uh, with others. Our first speaker will be Kimberly Stowers Moreland, uh, who is vice president of the Oregon Black Pioneers and owner of Moreland Resource Consulting where she uses her over 25 years of urban planning, economic development, and historic preservation experience to connect community builders to their local history and resources. On behalf of Oregon Black Pioneers, she authored Images of America, African Americans of Portland, which is of course available at the OHS Museum Store for purchase. And in 1995, she was on the project team that produced, produced Cornerstones of Community, the buildings of Portland's African American history. She's currently involved in efforts to produce a multiple property documentation history project for African-American resources in Oregon. So Kimberly will be speaking briefly to give some context to what you're going to learn about today from our speaker, Dr. Kenneth Hawkins, who earned a PhD in US history at the University of Rochester in 1991. He was associate editor of volume six and seven of the papers of Frederick Law Olmsted. And in 1993, he joined the National Archives and Records Administration as an archivist where he worked as the information technology program manager for the transfer of presidential electronic records from both the George W. Bush and Barack Obama White Houses to NARA. He retired in 2020 to resume researching and writing Oregon history. And in the winter 2020 issue of the Oregon Historical Quarterly, he published a primary source article that included letters written by A.H. Francis and published by uh, Frederick Douglass. And so I think you might be speaking about some of that as well. And that article is available to read on the OHS website and we'll enter a link for that into the chat. So please join me in welcoming Kimberly Moreland and Ken Hawkins. 
Thank you so much, Elijah, for that wonderful introduction. We truly treasure our partnership and, and relationship with um, the Oregon Historical Society. I'm so pleased to provide remarks on behalf of the Oregon Black Pioneers. I like to acknowledge um, Zachary Stock, our new executive director and the wonderful work that he does. Willie um, B. Richardson, who was one of the original founders of the Oregon Black Pioneers and now serve as a, the board uh, of our, the chairman of our board. And I also like to give, um, acknowledge our wonderful dedicated board members and their faithfulness to the organization. And also um, we really um, appreciate the support of all our donors and, and um, friends of the Oregon um, Black Pioneers. As um, Elijah so eloquently stated, the Oregon Black Pioneers um, exist to educate the general public about African-American history in Oregon. And we do this through our original publications, expositions, historical research, collaborations with special projects to honor sites with African-American historical significance and public programming. And on behalf of the Oregon Black Pioneers, I had the wonderful pleasure of working with the historian Bill Hawkins and Ted Kay and other members of the Lang Science Society of Portland to design and plan the historical marker dedication ceremony honoring Abner Hunt Francis and the 216 citizens who signed a petition to keep them um, in the Oregon territory. And I really um, value their partnership as well. So, why does all this matter? Um, why is Francis' family contributions and accomplishments important today? I just like to briefly share my perspective. The Francis accomplishments provide evidence that the people of African descent were a part of the historical development of Oregon before the statehood in, in 1859, and we were and African Americans were here shortly. Um, after the incorporation of Portland in 1850. Learning about Abner Hunt Francis, his wife Sidna, and brother Isaac changes the way that you interpret and view the history of Oregon. We have a glimpse of Black abolitionists um, who, uh, and their prof who uh, come to the territory with great hopes and and we share in their profound disappointment with the occlusion laws. This story in particular provides you with a whole new set of settlers that enriches the history of Oregon and Portland. The Francis accomplishment demonstrate the strength of Black people, especially considering how much the Francis accomplished without the privilege of power, place, and wealth. The Francis story gives you a glimpse of Black humanity. He was less than perfect. Abner Hunt Francis' letters had less than favorable opinion about the indigenous population. And Zachary Stock um, created a, a, a wonderful Oregon Black history presentation that includes an acknowledgement statement honoring uh, indigenous communities. And in his acknowledgement, he um, he acknowledged that the Black ancestors have participated in the violent uh, displacement of Native people. And he ends his acknowledgement by saying, we are committed to learning more and, do, and doing better. Black liberation is really, to me, the thing and at the front and center of the Abner Hunt Francis story. This quest for Black liberation began since the people of African descent arrived in the United States and what would become the United States. Francis journeyed from New York, Oregon territory, and later um, California and Victoria is a strong example of how Black people has been, Black people search, have been searching for a sense for a place where they can have the privilege to become successful entrepreneurs, um, quality, uh, have quality education for their children, and fulfill their God-given purpose in life. Colonialism 
um, did not work well for Francis and, and other Black settlers, and I think we can all agree on that. However, I can't help to believe that Abner Hunt Francis would not marvel at the accomplishments of African Americans in Oregon and the United States. We stand on their shoulder and others who braved this uncharted territory in search of a place where people of African descent can fully engage in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which we say is an unalienable right given by the creator of all humans. Finally, the Francis story demonstrates that Oregon would be a better place if Black settlers had been given the right to full citizenship. And this is our opportunity to know better and do better. Um, thank you. And I'll give it over to Ken. Thank you, Kim. Um, and thanks to Liza and OHS for the invitation to discuss uh, Abner Hunt Francis and his circle. I'd also like to thank Bill Hawkins and uh, Kim uh, Moreland, Kim and uh, Oregon Black Pioneers and the Lang Syne group for working to commemorate Francis and his family. I think Francis in particular would appreciate that we're meeting today on Constitution Day, uh, September 17th, as he was one of those who felt that the, the US Constitution could support anti-slavery positions, uh, including immediate abolition and guaranteed rights to all as citizens. And he was one of the group that joined, that uh, were working in the late 1840s to convince Frederick Douglass that that, that was the case. Douglass came around to that view to embrace the constitution and political engagement about that time. Francis was one of those folks. So today is a good day to have this event. Between his family history in the American Revolution and the ongoing fight against the slave power during his time, it was natural that Francis would reach for the legacy of rights owed to those who fought for liberty and found in the United States. So my goal today is to give you an overview of Abner Hunt Francis, situating him in both the abolitionist context and the context of Portland's founding, um, and then discuss a bit about what his and his circle's experiences uh, can tell us about hidden history sources and uh, recovering those. So founding narratives often focus on white town speculators like Pettigrove and Lovejoy, who prevailed in one control of a past normalized to their values. In 1863, Asa Lovejoy helped Portland printer Samuel J. McCormick draft and publish his, the first version of the city's founding narrative, the coin flip story and the arc of linear progress that followed. Their approach commodified both history and scenery in service to power. As an archivist and historian, I wanna find and share stories of people who rarely appear in the record and have been excluded from Oregon history. Doing that through uh, research in repositories, but also, and especially since the pandemic, digitally unlocked sources like newspapers, uh, census, passenger arrival lists, deeds, maps, and visual media, hoping to, uh, to basically to recover a narrative of Francis in a circle, just getting the facts right, getting the narrative correct. And then maybe allowing the possibility that telling that could give them somewhat of a voice or at least represent them and what they were doing, where they were, what they did. Um, the, the end result to complicate the origin, uh, origin stories with uh, Black's agency drive and achievements here in Oregon. Portland's 19th century Blacks were few in number, but great in courage. And they did leave enough traces in the record that we can begin to draw out the Black history that Oregonians later left out. And as a result, we can expand the available narratives. So the idea is to put this gentleman, H. Francis, his achievements and his uh, disappointments back into the history of Portland's founding decade. In September 1851, when H. Francis and his brother, I.B. Francis, had just immigrated from New York to Oregon and set up a business on Front Street in Portland, a judge ordered them to leave the territory. He found that they had violated Oregon's exclusion law, and which barred free, free and mixed race Black people from residence and most civil rights. Francis, uh, by this time, he had been an abolitionist for 20 years in 1851. So it's natural he brought his, his his concerns about race, rights, and respectability uh, when he arrived in the Oregon Territory in California in 1851. For the next decade, he and his circle would resist racist power openly in black print culture and by seeking fortune and stature in Portland's founding generation of merchants. 
Um, others arriving in Portland that year included H.W. Corbett, William S. Ladd, C.H. Lewis, and Josiah Failing and his sons. Um, several of those actually did sign the petition for the Francis brothers. So um, Francis and his brother negotiated and found accommodations with the powers that animated Oregon's political culture, most of them white, many of them racist. These accommodations were direct uh, and indirect as circumstances allowed. The petition is probably the prime example. And they were uh, also the ground on which identities were defined and displayed. At first, he was confident that Oregon would allow business initiative to prevail and the Exclusion Act would be overturned, despite the preponderance of Southerners in Oregon. Uh, these hopes seemed within reach, but were fraught from, from his vantage point looking forward. Of, of the settler projects underway in Oregon, when the Francis brothers traded on Front Street, none were fully realized on the ground. They included um, extinguishing indigenous title to lands, surveying and transferring lands to white possession, and settling the question of who were citizens um, entitled to own and reside on property, who, who qualified as a citizen, who qualified to, to own property and live on it. Um, each of these projects would have winners and losers, and Francis had opinions and stakes on all of the projects. By 1855, it was clear to him that racism persisted in Oregon, even coloring the simple act of paying a business tax or placing a newspaper advertisement. Nonetheless, Francis remained and earned the commercial stature he sought, even as Oregon approved its new constitution, which excluded blacks and excluded slavery. He carried on business here until 1861, when friends and observers uh, both agreed, racial prejudice forced him to leave for Victoria, BC. For the next decade, he worked his way back to a position of respect. Um, he voted, he kept shop, and with his wife and family nearby, lived in a cottage they owned in the suburbs of Victoria until his death in 1872. Uh, slide, please. Francis was an abolitionist in New Jersey, where he was born in New York since 1831. He had worked most recently with Frederick Douglass to attack slavery and elevate Black people to respectability through education and improvement. In the minutes of um, abolition meetings where he was the secretary at uh, national and state colored conventions and the letters to Black newspapers, Francis explored the American Revolution's legacy of rights for Blacks, opposed schemes to colonize with to, to colonize Africa with American Blacks, and promoted opportunities available through economic uplift and immigration to the American West. These ideas comprised forceful and genuine resistance to slavery and racism at the time, and were central to the free Black abolitionist movement that Francis helped lead. After uh, meeting Douglas, when he spoke at a convention Francis or helped organize in 1843, the two built a working relationship that lasted years. In September 1848, Francis and Douglas supported Black uplift at the National Convention of Colored Freemen in, in Cleveland. Returning to Western New York on the steamers, steamer Oregon, Douglas was so pleased with their work that he exulted, quote, another Oregon free soil victory. Oh, the cause is rolling on, unquote. In the summer of 1850, uh, Francis helped Douglas procure a steamboat cabin to travel from Buffalo to another convention. Douglas had uh, by then published over a dozen of Francis's letters in the North Star. One year later, in June of 1851, Francis immigrated to the Pacific coast by steamboat, taking the Isthmus route, and then his ship from Panama to uh, uh, San Francisco, the seabird, uh, hit a rock, almost sank, and was stranded at Baja. Uh, they eventually arrived in late July. Next slide. Francis had followed frontiers not as a settler, but as a merchant in town centers from Trenton, New Jersey to Buffalo, uh, now to San Francisco and soon to Portland. Um, he's known to us largely thanks to local and black print culture, including newspapers that were published by Douglas, um, Philip A. Bell, Martin Delaney and Mifflin W. Gibbs. Without print culture, we would know very little about Francis, his family, fellow abolitionists, and his allies and adversaries, white and black, in all those states from New York to Oregon to BC. Um, Francis contributed to black uh, print culture as a subscriber, patron, and writer for The Colored American, The North Star, Frederick Douglass's paper, The Pacific Appeal, and The Elevator. 
uh, in California between 1831 and 1865. Between 1848 and 60, um, Francis had, um, had had over 20 letters published uh, by Frederick Douglass, um, about 10 of them from, from New York and then ultimately over a dozen from Oregon. Local newspapers uh, as well, like the Buffalo Republic, the Weekly Oregonian, and the Daily Colonists, and even the Democratic Party papers here in Portland in the 1850s also took notice of the Francis brothers, their friends and doings, and uh, not to uh, mention their advertisements providing us with vital clues. And the quotes there on the screen are, are from uh, various of those publications over time, uh, including the, the third one there uh, where he was writing to, to Douglas and describing what was going on uh, in Portland in terms of his uh, being required to uh, pay taxes, but it was illegal for him to swear an oath. So he had a uh, kind of a, a conflict with the county recorder. Uh, next slide. Um, next slide. There we go. Uh, so I've sort of laid these out in those in the three different kind of locations with somewhat of a family tree, and then also some visuals on the side. One aspect about Francis is visual sources of him directly are just absolutely almost non-existent. So there's it's not there's not a, a rich sort of visual record, but I've, I've done what I can here. So anyway, um, Francis often signed his name as just simply the initials A.H., but his full name, as we know, was Abner Hunt Francis. The name itself tells the story of uh, enslavement and emancipation because Hunt is from um, Nathaniel Hunt, Mercer County, New Jersey's Justice of the Peace, who also happened to be the enslaver of Abner's mother, Mary Francis, uh, near Princeton, New Jersey. Um, they had, uh, there's their list of children uh, that come from their wills and court records and various things. Um, they uh, listed their uh, children um, in those documents. So we know those are the correct names of, of the children and their approximate birth dates. Um, those in gray were active abolitionists. Um, and in one case, a documented conductor on the Underground Railroad in Buffalo. And they also were advocates in black print culture. Um, several of them appeared on, this, on the US Census as uh, being of mixed race with African heritage, including AH. Um, in New Jersey, uh, emancipation was, was gradual and slow to come for many. Uh, when Nathaniel Hunt died in 1811, he still held uh, enslaved people. And at his son's death uh, in 1846, the estate included two unfinished terms of indentured servants. And if you look at the names there of the children and you look at the name Hunt and also Nathaniel there, um, you can see how Mary named her sons is saying something about her relationship with Nathaniel Hunt. And we don't know enough to, to know if she was, well, what the, what the real story is there. And of course, there's a lot of suppressed history around um, sexual violence against enslaved women. Um, and it was, I came across several really um, disturbing stories of uh, violence against the enslaved there in New Jersey. You don't, you think of New Jersey as a free state in the North, but it was one of the states like New York that opted for gradual emancipation and, and all the suffering that went along with that. Um, in, eight, in 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, there were parades across the country and including in the, their hometown of Flemington, Jacob Francis, Abner's father, who had served in uh, both the New Jersey militia and the Continental Line under General Washington, was relegated to an unmarked spot near the end of the parade. He had been a storekeeper and owned a small house but had struggled to obtain a pension in his old age uh, for the service he had rendered at the country's birth. So that was in the background while Abner would have been about 13 at the time. Um, next slide, please. So A.H. Francis moved to Buffalo, New York uh, in 1835. It was the Western terminus of the Erie Canal, uh, opened in 1825 and became the shipping depot for grain exports uh, from upstate New York and, and a gateway to the Midwest. Its population doubled between 1830 and 1840 and then grew to nearly 50,000 by 1850. It was also a Northern station on the Underground Railroad uh, for those escaping uh, slavery to freedom in nearby Canada. So on the right side, you see a map there of, of Buffalo from about 1851, um, and it shows what it was like during uh, Francis's residency there. 
the Niagara River is on the left and the kind of the lower left. Uh, the city plat is up to the right and the Erie Canal there comes into the bottom. And then um, the, um, the various locations there all sort of uh, go through. He, um, when he arrived in 35, 1835, he immediately bought property with his partner, fellow abolitionist, Robert Banks. And then uh, by 1837, he had married Sid Sidna E.R. Dandridge, daughter of Charlotte and John Dandridge. Uh, and that's the correct full name there from various legal documents, um, both and I say that because her name is often sort of misspelled or misinterpreted, but in any case, both Danridge and, and I.B. Francis worked at uh, the Mercantile Store while all of them were involved, um, along with William Qualls, in founding the Second Baptist Church on Michigan Avenue in 1838. Uh, that's the church there pictured. Um, it still stands today. If you're ever in Buffalo, you can go to the church that they built in 1845. Um, their residence was about six blocks to the south, and then as you can see, uh, close by was his place of uh, em employment, a store. Um, Sidna's parents would accompany um, her and, and Abner through their careers on the Pacific coast and the Northwest, but less is known about their origins besides what we have in the census, that they were born in Virginia at the turn of 1800. They did share a name with the family of Martha Washington in Virginia, who herself had several brothers that carried, the, carried forward the surname Dandridge. Um, that's an unknown. Further research, stay tuned. Um, we'll see what we can find out. Um, H and Sidna carried on as abolitionists throughout the, the, the decade as detailed in my OHQ article, um, but no evidence has surfaced yet suggesting they had any children during the Buffalo years. She was active in social causes, including literacy, and was a favorite of Philip Bell and Frederick Douglass, who published two of her letters. Um, the other brothers there, Isaac and Ralph. Isaac bought property in uh, in Buffalo and worked for his brother. Um, their younger brother, Ralph, actually resided in Rochester where he worked as a barber and organized West Indian emancipation celebrations that the North Star published. Slide. So uh, on the next slide, we can see that the uh, Francis and Banks uh, under item three there, they uh, kept one of Buffalo's leading fashionable men's dress and furnishing store directly on the terrace overlooking where the Erie Canal entered downtown. Uh, he used that place for well over a decade from the mid 1830s to 40s and uh, partnered with Banks and then James W. Garrett, both of whom were abolitionists. Um, Dandridge and Qualls raised money and sort of put sweat equity uh, in to build the Second Baptist Church and then in 1847 worked directly on the Underground Railroad in Buffalo. With Francis, they took, uh, they also took steps to organize a vigilance committee to protect black citizens that year. Next slide. So I know there's a lot of detail on this next slide. There's a lot of text. Uh, but really just focus, uh, and you can dive in the details if you want, but if you focus on the sequence of names listed at left, you pretty much have a who's who and a history of American abolitionism in, in sequence. Francis was right in the middle of the movement from its beginnings in the early 1830s, well before Douglas, into, uh, and worked eventually into a close relationship with him by 1848. Um, in between, Francis met several gentlemen who would uh, help propel him to the West. Uh, for Garrison, uh, he was um, an agent for the Liberator newspaper and Garrison quoted him, uh, uh, his thoughts on colonization in one of his books in his newspaper. Um, uh, Philip A. Bell, um, really interesting character, edited the Colored American newspaper, uh, left New York City for California in 1856 um, and wrote uh, a short biographical uh, entry on Francis, which is invaluable. And then Francis uh, uh, advertised his um, store in the Mirror of the Times, edited by Mifflin Gibbs in 1847, uh, and joined him in Victoria the following year, closing real estate deals, baptizing children, finding homes, and fighting racism. Um, both uh, Gibbs and his partner, Peter Lesher, uh, undertook substantive careers in Victoria and uh, sought commercial good fortune, expanded rights for black citizens, and were unafraid to call out racism uh, in newspapers with the razor sharp wit and pen. Um, the uh, William Wells Brown 
worked with Francis in 1843 to organize the National Convention of Colored Men uh, in Buffalo in 1843, of which Douglas spoke. Um, that's when they first met. Uh, just two weeks after the convention, Francis was seated on a petit, petit jury in the Buffalo Recorder's Court, which an astonished correspondent of the Alexandria Gazette from Virginia remarked that this was the first time a Black had been seated on an American jury. But the writer also dwelled on, on uh, A.H.'s physical appearance and his habit of cropping his natural hair close and wearing a wig of straight Black hair, a practice he continued in Oregon. Several leading characters in Brown's novel, Clotel, the first African-American novel, were of mixed race and they too followed a social course towards respectability by dressing fashionably, which was Abner's business in his mercantile store, fashionable clothes, and also passing as white. Um, that's Francis to the abolitionist. Douglas uh, commented on Francis in, in August 1848 uh, when he was in Buffalo for the National Free Soil Convention. Um, we, we, were, we held on Wednesday evening an interesting anti-slavery meeting in Buffalo where we acknowledge many fine friends among whom are our much esteemed Admiral Francis and Lady at whose house and table we always find a hearty welcome. Such persons make the pathway of the weary laborer in the cause of humanity, however dreary, a delightful way, a way of pleasantness. Um, they were very close, traveled together in that time frame. Um, but when I found that quote, I was thrilled to the moon. So uh, on to Oregon and California. So um, in Oregon, if we can have, there we go. Uh, in Oregon, the Francis brothers repeated that argument for economic uplift and respectability when they petitioned the territorial legislature in the fall of 1851 to exempt them from exclusion uh, or to overturn the law, identifying themselves as, quote, honest and ind industrious, quote, uh, men of business. It almost reads like a letter to the North Star, frankly, the body of the petition, uh, which is on the State Archives website, and it's also uh, referenced, of course, in the article. Um, <laughs> the legislature debated and then tabled the petition and took no action. The judge's expulsion order stood, but was never enforced. The Francis brothers remained in Portland and were soon free to operate as they did for 10 years, beginning in 1851. And so sort of following that, the, the line of who was with him, because you can find out so much more about him by looking at who was around him, who followed him from Buffalo all the way out west. Um, Dandridge, uh, his father-in-law and his brother, um, both were in California. We don't know when they arrived. They probably came by steamboat they may have come in the, um, and taken the Isthmus route. They may have been in steerage, and so their names wouldn't have been listed on the passenger list. But um, I.B. was there uh, by August of 1851 and Dandridge by mid-1853 when he and Sidna bought residential lots in San Francisco. Um, Dandridge probably visited Portland, but he was never a resident, moved to Victoria in 1858 and stayed there for a decade. And of course, I.B. went to Portland with Abner in, in August of 51. So that the presence of the 1851 petition in Oregon State Archives ensured the Francis brothers' argument for equal rights and the names of those white Oregonians who supported them would be known to history. And among the, the, the petitions, 200 signatories were settlers, merchants, ship captains, uh, future mayors and senators, <clears throat> lawyers, including their own lawyer, Franklin Tilford, editors and two of Portland's then four town proprietors, three if you count John H. Cooch as a proprietor. Um, Democratic uh, Colonel W.W. W. Chapman, one of the town proprietors noted his support only for the special act that is for the Francis brothers not to exempt, um, not, not to overturn the uh, expulsion law. Um, so this is sort of a form of, in a way, pushback from the periphery onto the, the center uh, where there was pushback against exclusion by a certain small number of people, uh, similar to what Jackie Hedlund Tyler found with uh, sailors in Oregon. Um, she has an article in OHQ from 2016 that I can see some parallels with. Um, but so the, after the exclusion order went unenforced, the Francis brothers and their associates went into action. Isaac ran the store from the Columbian Hotel on Front and Washington, which you can see there on the east side of, of Front, now NATO Parkway. 
until 1854 and then moved to a new brick building on the southwest corner of Front and Stark Street, uh, now Harvey Milk Street, um, at the time also known as Ferry Street. He called it, uh, he ran it, um, IB ran the store until 1856 uh, when he died in California and um, Frank A.H. then took the store over and was assisted in part by James Garrett, who had been his partner in Buffalo. They advertised incessantly using papers of all political events uh, and featuring clever copy and illustrations in their appeals, and uh, including one that cleverly used the abolitionist call to action still they come. So speaking of uh, uh, coming and arriving, they between the time they were in Portland, Abner and Isaac were named on 40 steamship passenger lists between San Francisco and Portland, as well as to Victoria. And that was when a cabin fare cost $75. Um, one way. So um, steamboat travel was dangerous and sometimes was even more costly as we know about the brother Jonathan and General Warren and other steam shipwrecks that Francis was uh, either witnessed or, or helped with. Um, at the same time, Francis wrote over a dozen letters from Oregon to his friend Douglas documenting its systemic racism and supporting black rights. Um, they showed how racism in the territory was uh, a reflection of slavery politics in the US, how establishment whites worked to thwart black leaders such as Francis, and how a network of lesser known abolitionists joined Francis and Douglas for years to resist um, white supremacy across the nation. Oregon was not the only place that passed laws to exclude blacks from residence and legal rights and remedies guaranteed to American citizens. After the admission of uh, Maine in 1818, every state admitted to the Union before the Civil War confined suffrage to whites. Uh, several new and old states uh, enacted strict exclusions on residence, land ownership, and legal testimony. Illinois, Indiana, and Oregon included black exclusion in their constitutions. So this, not, this is not to minimize the situation in Oregon, but to remind us that it derived from an ongoing crises that were national in scope. And you can kind of see it in this political map of the US after the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, in fact, Francis was on the steamship Petona arriving in Portland in February 1854 that carried the sensational news that Congress had opened Kansas and Nebraska to slavery, overturning the Missouri Compromise. And many people were extremely concerned at the time that that meant that slavery could be uh, voted in essentially through the so-called popular sovereignty in all sorts of territories, including ones that were ostensibly free territories. Um, the same year uh, as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Frederick Douglass wrote about Francis, quote, distance does not damp his zeal in the cause of his people's freedom and elevation. So second important slide is um, just sort of going again, and you can kind of see the list of names there is growing, but his white, he had a wide circle of allies and enemies in Portland and California in, uh, in this time. Um, he also participated uh, and witnessed historic events such as being there when one of Oregon's earliest sales of real property to a black man, James Garrett, an abolitionist no less, was uh, happened in 1853. And this is during the time the, the Exclusion Act was in force and he bought the land from arguably one of the most prominent racist and town proprietors, Benjamin Stark Jr. Um, so Francis's customers and passerby uh, could find their stores first in the Columbian Hotel there on the left, and then uh, in the two-story fireproof brick building further down the street, uh, visible uh, sort of in the middle part. Um, Francis uh, devoted more time and to the store and to advertising there after his brother's uh, death. So. On the ground in Portland, uh, Francis publicly supported the, the settler colonial projects that used Portland citizens as militia and the town as a launching ground for attacks on indigenous people in Southern Oregon and in the Yakima River Valley. Um, he donated money in 1856 to Multnomah Engine Company Number no. 2, A.B. Halleck uh, was the foreman, uh, along with Corbett Stark, Failings, and others. Uh, and he even participated in a so-called vigilance committee with leading citizens in Portland, not to protect anyone escaping oppression, but that lynched and banished uh, a man uh, in Portland accused of uh, visiting a house of ill repute. 
So um, there's one account that mentions that and there's several newspaper articles, but there's definitely something going on there of, of interest. So while Francis balanced accommodation on the ground and advocacy in print, something about him really peeved a number of Oregon Democrats, especially Asahel Bush, editor of Salem's Weekly Statesman, which was the de facto party organ for the Democratic Party. <laughs> um, also among the circle was uh, Frank Tilford, his lawyer and former recorder of San Francisco. Uh, he was the first one to sign the petition. I think he probably wrote it, but his name is first on it. Um, Robert Banks uh, was one of the first abolitionists of the abolitionist cohort to, to immigrate to California. Um, and he resided north of San Francisco until returning east in 1865. Philip Bell came out. Um, he arrived in about 1856. Uh, in the 1860s, he was still an editor and he stopped briefly in Portland on the way to go visit Francis in Victoria. And he said about Portland, quote, in 1863, I walked twice around the city before breakfast and saw everything and everybody worth seeing, unquote. Um, so I guess he was a San Francisco guy, but anyway. Um, and then Garrett had been a presence in the city since 1853 and partnered again with Francis in 57. He died at Francis's store in May of 1858 uh, and then left money to Francis that allowed him to buy that lot and store six months later in, in uh, November. Um, Qualls made it out. He roomed with, uh, to California, roomed with Francis in 1860 and died in California in 1863. And then William Brown is a very interesting fellow. He escaped enslavement in Maryland in the 18, early 1850s and made his way west, uh, landing in Victoria in 1858. Um, he moved to, he, and then he worked with Francis in, in Victoria, but he moved to Portland, <coughs> excuse me, in 1866 and was an active leader in that small but stalwart black community for the next two decades. Uh, and then finally, Thomas Dreyer, editor of the Oregonian, old school Whig, strong unionist, eventually a Republican. Um, he uh, defended Francis in Oregon's territorial legislature during debates in 1857 on renew and exclusion and castigated the move to uh, gag debate about slavery during the Constitutional Convention that summer. Very interesting reading in, that, in those debates. And he took a lot of heat from Bush and the, and the statesman for his friendly, friendly relations, business-like though they were with Francis. At Dreyer's uh, 1879 funeral, William Brown was a Paul bearer. Um, so in the last few years of doing business in Portland, uh, next slide, Francis uh, attained through his business presence the, the status requisite to be featured uh, in the lead vignette of commercial buildings in this important visual document, Kuchel and Russell's View of Portland, 1858. Um, he was, uh, it's, it gives us the clearest view of the two-story brick building occupied by Francis on Front Street <clears throat> and two doors down from William S. Ladd's store and across the street from the Metropolis Hotel. And this engraving is the most public visual uh, resource that uh, names Francis. Um, 1858 was also the year that he, he bought the, uh, the property and lot of the store. Um, at the time, he also had seized control of his own history and advertised himself as, port, as the pioneer merchant of Oregon and made, um, if we can press maybe the next uh, thing so that slide animates there, um, we'll get those two. Uh, he started calling himself the pioneer merchant of Oregon then and then eventually was showing up on list of the wealthiest merchants. And if you kind of skim through that, you can see he's right in there with all the people we consider the founding fathers of, of Oregon. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, by this time, he had been in the, in the business long enough. He was reminiscing about meeting Douglas 20 years before and was hopeful for the future, uh, the dawn of that brighter era um, with right as, uh, Lincoln was being elected. This was his last letter to Douglas that was published and um, um, what a ride he and the country were about to take and find out whether that era would, would arrive or not. Next slide. Indeed, were tumultuous after 18, uh, after the Dred Scott decision in, in 58. Um, there were mass meetings at uh, black churches in San Francisco 
and taking up offers from Governor James Douglas of um, BC to immigrate there, and then the Fraser River Gold Rush in BC. So it appears uh, Abner attended some of these meetings, and his father moved to father-in-law moved to Victoria in 1858. Um, shortly after he. Francis returned to Portland in the spring of 58. There was a near riot at a meeting led by Democrats on the open ground opposite the Francis store. Um, for their part in this time frame, Francis and Sydenham began to buy about a half dozen parcels, lots of real estate that year in Victoria uh, and were buying these lots all the way up to the time that they left Oregon. So they were shifting their money and resources to Victoria when all the stuff was going on that I've been discussing and uh, essentially sunk that money into real estate and managed to hold on to it. Um, so once he moved up there, his steamboat travel almost disappeared. Uh, and as you can see here, um, I just kind of overview that time frame. but uh, you see some of the same names. They all had connections and came up uh, to Victoria or had some uh, business ongoing with Francis at the time. And in particular, uh, Francis, um, or rather William Brown, uh, was was in Victoria and helped Francis organize a uh, West Indian Emancipation celebration in 1865. Um, Bell visited him there. So uh, Francis also supported Victoria's All Black Pioneers Pioneer Rifle Company financially and as an officer. He was present at several auspicious occasions with the company, including when it was disinvited to an audience with the incoming governor who succeeded uh, Douglas. Um, they, uh, Abner and Sidna lived with uh, her parents uh, while he went through bankruptcy proceedings in 1862 and three, but they did manage to hold on to all but one lot through their entire years in the city of Victoria. He became a naturalized citizen of the British Commonwealth in late 1863 and kept grocery stores on Yates and Fort Streets. Uh, eventually, he obtained a mortgage uh, through, uh, to, uh, one, through the Auditor General of BC and the Attorney General, <laughs> and this became Francis's five-acre suburban property uh, at Fizz Garden Quadra in BC, which would be their home uh, with, with trees and springs and plantings until his death in 1872. So, um, we're getting up. I'm going to try to wrap it up here in, in a little short amount of time, but basically where Francis and Garrett first acquired and held property and other blacks, other blacks followed in Portland and undertook business and residence and activism there through the Civil War and into Reconstruction. Uh, several of them knew and had connections with Francis directly. Um, among those were Mary Carr, who arrived in 1858 and bought and sold property in Portland. Uh, she ran a boarding house up until her death in 1911. She uh, also um, uh, collaborated with others, such as William Brown, to set up uh, Emancipation Day and uh, 15th Amendment processions and assemblies. Uh, Brown came into Portland in 1866 and bought lots of property in Carruthers, in, um, Carruthers Edition. <laughs> and then um, George P. Riley called the Frederick Douglass of Oregon. Uh, he had been in BC and worked with Francis uh, for Black Solidarity and Elevation there. And then he um, is associated with Portland quite closely. He bought a residential lot in Albina in 1875 and established the Working Men's Joint Stock Association of Portland to let Black members pool resources to purchase real estate. Um, they also, uh, he worked closely with uh, General Oliver Howard there uh, and gave um, speeches at a commemoration of the death of Crispus Attucks, the first black uh, of the American Revolution, the first black, the first American, I'm sorry, to die in the American Revolution. And they held uh, emancipation celebrations that were quite large, quite involved in involved processions and assemblies. And uh, at the one in 1869, um, one of the writers noted that the main speaker, who is the bishop of the AME Church, uh, um, who was welcomed by the audience, quote, left the impression that if this is the white man's country, some black men are not afraid to talk in it, because he was frequently interrupted by applause that shook the building. Um, so, Matthew, so um, 
as you can see, the numbers there uh, are quite interesting and quite low. Matthew Deedy called the Exclusion Act a dead letter, <clears throat> and others dismissed the state constitution's exclusion. But the small numbers of Blacks in Oregon showed that it worked, that that exclusion worked as a deterrent to Black migration for years. The Blacks that did live in Oregon were oppressed, but were also agents of history. With others yet to be discovered, they complicate histories of Oregon that reduce it to a place where stovepipe-hatted men flipped a coin to name Portland or built a white utopia without Black people. So Samuel McCormick's um, was the first to print that coin flip story of Portland's naming uh, in 1863. And he did it in this building here on the left. It was the Carter Block uh, built uh, in 1866 on the corner of Front and Alder. The second story of this building was used at the same time by Portland's Black benevolent organizations as its meeting place, including church groups and the Grant Invincibles who supported the former general's presidential election in 1872. Thus the narrative that McCormick passed along as history was printed next door to other histories that went ignored. Not only does Portland's coin flip narrative put white town speculators front and center, but it elided every other historical narrative that might have been told alongside it. It still has that effect. Those uh, who contested for Portland's patent won control of the past normalized to their values and created narratives that are repeated today and preserve both capital and whiteness. Uh, most histories uh, do not mention Abbott or do not mention uh, Francis. Um, and some of those that did, like Joseph Gaston, who was a friend of Ladd's, focused either on his race or his physical characteristics before dismissing him sometimes with an epithet or a stereotype. But Francis was with the abolitionists that called for black aspiration to respectable trades and, and achievements based on effort. He, he also consistently called for acknowledgement of the commemorations um, of black contributions to the American Revolution and centered uh, events on um, Crispus Attucks and his own father, Jacob Francis's service in the uh, revolution. Um, he wrote letters on this topic to Bell, Douglas, and others, uh, bringing attention to the achievements of Blacks in fighting for American freedom and, so, and uh, that deserve reward. Um, the, the coin flip story in inventing uh, historical narratives, if you can click once there, um, in Oregon continued into the era of boosterism and uh, at the turn of the century. With the help of R.V. Holman and George Himes of OHS, historical production emerged as a way to shape ideas about ang Anglo-Saxon racialism and to create new recreational spaces to promote restricted residential districts atop Portland's West Hills. The new space and the new roles came at Himes' doing, complete with an invented Indian historical narrative that made it into parade floats and the naming of Council Crest. Um, the other, uh, the, the um, other thing that was going on was essentially this conversion of land into territory. So uh, the same law that in 1850 that established the Surveyor General in Oregon to survey it in accordance with the uh, Northwest Ordinance land division system empowered the Surveyor General to administer and adjudicate land entries made for donation lands for whites who had settled before uh, 1851. <laughs> As uh, Samuel Torres Roof has said, making race and making place were part of the same project. Um, as a Whig uh, appointee, the Surveyor General was not greeted warmly by Democrats in Oregon, but he did accomplish much of the surveying and also decided two important cases related to the Portland land claim. Uh, the decisions went against Lounsdale, uh, Daniel Lounsdale and McNamee who protested. Um, next slide. So he was, they were working very quickly to lay down those meridians and baselines and so quickly that uh, they were under pressure from um, white, uh, eager white seekers of land uh, who wanted to seek advantages and title in the, in the region's commercial depot without waiting for the feds. That is basically the townsite proprietors proceeded to survey, map and sell lots in the Portland land claim offering warranty deeds as promises of title until the US decided 
and awarding patents. Uh, they modeled their plats on a conception of urban space, use, and, and associated identities that protected the power they held and wanted well prior to the determination of whether they or those contesting their claims owned it. Um, this was a seller project that someone like Francis could only experience and comment on as an observer. So the plat on the left it was uh, Lounsdale's uh, that he convinced the city council to adopt in 1852 based on a map by um, an earlier map known as the Brady map, which has proved elusive for years. Um, and this was over a year um, before, well, this was several years before uh, any title had been awarded, uh, but it does include block 39 on which the Francis store was located. Plat on the right is the original of the one Lounsdale submitted to the GLO, the General Land Office, in support of this case. And I found this about three years ago. Um, it, depicts, it depicts Portland about seven years before it was filed in 1860, next slide, and uh, gives us some interesting clues about the town. It shows there on the lower right, the four acre parcel that Pettigrove and Stark split between themselves, taking the uh, two halves respectively, uh, later known as Stark's Common. It was utilized, this space was utilized as a public meeting ground uh, and saw assemblies uh, when Joseph Lane, the territorial delegate, spoke, uh, as well as large gatherings to log bowls for political rallies. Um, it was succeeded in the 1860s by the plaza blocks down by the courthouse now. Um, <coughs> and um, excuse me. Uh, also, it shows in the, the lots along the river are unnumbered and presumably open. And so that became the topic of a lawsuit between Par J.L. Parrish and, and Lounsdale uh, over uh, keeping that, what they called the levee, open and free or closing it in and building on it. And we know that it eventually was built on. But the fact that is the matter is that uh, at the time, Parrish was sub-agent to Anson Dart and was supposed to be negotiating with indigenous people here for treaties to transfer that title. But the fact is that this time, none of those treaties have been formally approved or signed. So they were carving up the land and projecting how it would be arranged long before they had title to it. So um, by looking at uh, the original sources and following the narratives they established, we are complicating the origin stories of Portland and recovering lost narratives around identity and place integral to its creation um, slide. So here, this is just the, the no, no portraits or photos have been found of him yet. Uh, and so that makes it hard to imagine him, but what really erased him was the exclusion in Oregon's histories that sort of erased him. Um, Francis himself though left copious evidence of his, of his own self-construction while those of his critics were equally revealing of who they thought he should be. Um, his efforts to present himself as respectable to the white establishment in Oregon lay behind the petition that they wrote in 1851 to its legislatures. Um, the 211 white Oregonians who signed it in, in support accommodated the overture. Black resistance and white supremacy in this case were not binary and static, but complex and dynamic. Um, in this way, the story, his Francis story tells of a middle ground between free blacks and whites in Oregon as it joined the union as a free state. Um, and it was a sort of a tentative um, tribute to respectability or, or a tentative solution because it lasted until it didn't last. Uh, it was an expedient that held for a few years until it was overtaken by a frontier of exclusion <clears throat> that materialized in the law and practices on the ground. Uh, it was brave and admirable to, for, his, for him to resist uh, and the future could be alluring to an optimist like Francis, but the deep-seated power of white supremacy and racism pushed back and uh, acknowledging it was less cynical than realistic and perhaps as contended by Paul Gil Gilroy in the Black Atlantic, a sign of modernist acknowledgements of limits and contingency. And that's what makes Francis to me so fascinating. For one contingent moment, they were subject to an expulsion order by the Supreme Court of Oregon, but uh, um, convinced over 200 white merchant settlers and politicians to make an exception for them. 
And then they found and ran one of Portland's principal mercantile establishments for the next 10 years. All while Francis continued to write his friend Douglas a series of remarkable letters documenting Oregon and California's systemic white supremacy. And then just like that, that time was passed, gone and mostly forgotten until now. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you so much, Ken. We really appreciate all that you managed to pack into a short 50 minutes or so. And we have a few questions from the audience. Um, and also just want to let folks know if you do have questions, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, but one question here, there's, there's gratitude to you for including uh, Mary Carr and William Bell and George P. Riley, uh, who were all part of the Working Men's Joint Stock Association. And wondering about um, additional potential connections between Francis and particularly other Black leaders who were in Portland, um, specifically asking about James and Mary Beatty, who we believe came to Portland about 1864, so a little bit after Francis left. But did he maintain some connections? What were some of the other uh, kinds of networks and, and political work that he was doing with others at the time? Yeah, again, the, the record is sort of is so thin that you really, I'm grasping at, you know, any evidence I can find. And I've sort of ramped up the research in the past two years. So a lot of what I'm trying to, what I'm able to find is through, you know, newspapers.com and, you know, familysearch.org, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he did maintain connections with Portland. He didn't sell his lot in Portland for another three years, and then he sold it to William S. Ladd. And then he advertised in the Oregonian in 1867 and uh, said, hey, you all remember me. Well, now I'm in Victoria and I'm ready to take your produce on commission. Um, beyond that level of detail, we just don't, because there's no set of his papers, uh, we have to look for ever, evidence where we can find. And those two names are not yet familiar. But the, I was delighted to find that he had this, and it was in my notes from a couple years ago, that, that he had worked directly uh, with Riley and then with this William Brown. And of course, William Brown's a fairly common name, but I'm about 90% sure that I've tracked him as being related to Francis, you know, early on in, in the, in, he may, he came from Maryland, it may have been quite a bit longer, but that uh, Brown was really one of the leading figures of the Portland black community in the um, 1860s and 70s. And it just, it's amazing to me to think of these grant invincibles in uniform with light, lighted banners and arms marching from first and alder all the way through downtown and up to the courthouse square and then having this big uh, reception and and uh, where you know the speech happened and everything it's just you know I've never read that in any other history of Portland I think it's it's mentioned here and there I think Kim may have mentioned some that there's some overlap here um, but the, the amount of detail that's available if you look for it is quite astonishing. Oh, that's fascinating. And it is interesting, you know, thinking about these connections of Black Americans uh, across the West Coast from British Columbia into Oregon and down into California and the, the amount of movement that was going back and forth. And you spoke to this a little bit, but uh, one of our audience members is, is asking about why Francis and the family uh, moved to Canada. You know, there was the invitation uh, from James Douglas. There was, of course, the gold fields. Um, and then you're also talking about how by 1867, he's, he's um, seeking out other uh, business partners in Portland to sell goods um, in British Columbia. Can you talk a little bit more about why you think he made that choice to move there um, and what the context was? Well, he himself did not explain it. So we have to look at the context, the context to find out. And I, in going back over this, there's a couple of sort of unfriendly accounts of Francis, like Joseph Gaston and James O'Meara, who can't help but sort of use racist tropes and whatnot. But they both mentioned that the climate in Portland was just not conducive to a black man. So he left and went to Victoria, and they couched it in terms which you know are disappointing, but. Then Philip Bell, who is a fellow abolitionist, he basically said the same thing, but he just said it straight out. He said it was the, 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 the racism and the laws drove him out. And then in, on the scene, on the ground in 1861, the Oregonian reported and others reported that Francis had failed and that he, was, that he owed money to creditors. And the creditors pursued him to Vancouver and he went through a whole series of, uh, of the bankruptcy process there uh, it actually 
helped undermine his when he was elected to the city council in Victoria in 1865. He held the seat for like two days and then they said, well, you're in bankruptcy court and you weren't on the tax rolls in 1863. So out you go. Um, so some of that I'm still picking up and I sort of touched on his gambit. And I remember going through some of the, the notices about the bankruptcy. They said, we think he's trying to hide that his wife owns lots and we wanna get our hands on those as his creditors. They did manage to do that, but I think that was part of what was going on. And the descriptions that were made about Francis doing that at the time um, used some interesting language, like the, the term skedaddler was used when someone in 1863 told this anecdote about the lynching. They said, Francis was a Willem barber, a former barber, uh, a merchant and a skedaddler. And I sort of looked at the etymology of the word skedaddle, and apparently that was one of the earliest times it was used, but that was what some people thought of him. And um, I'm not going to judge. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I know that, um, you know, the, the issue of racism in Portland uh, driving Black people away from the city is one we continue to have today. So that's really fascinating. Um, Kimberly spoke a little bit about uh, the complexity of Francis as a human being and, and some of the things that he said that we that we don't um, that we don't take pride in or, or don't want to honor, um, particularly some of his attitudes toward indigenous people. Were there other things or, or do you want to speak more about that that you found about Francis that was disappointing? I mean, obviously, we want to laud him for being an abolitionist and uh, someone who was working for black liberation. Um, and for being um, courageous and successful in Portland's early years. But what about him was disappointing to you in your research? Well, I think probably finding um, and coming across his remarks on the indigenous people that are reprint that are reprinted in the OHQ um, article from last year, um, that he he definitely he bought so much into the whole kind of um, program of respectability politics that abolitionists had embraced, you know, they essentially, you know, defaulted to embracing the value system of the predominant white commercial culture and sort of education, schooling, you know, hard work, get ahead, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, et cetera. And there were aspects of that which kind of implied a hierarchy. So in any hierarchy, you need to have people who were at the higher end and maybe, and then those down below. And so, um, it was disappointing to find his remarks both on that and also on sort of the laboring class of blacks who worked at so-called menial tasks like sweeping or you know stewards or whatnot uh, that he made at one of the colored conventions because they were all saying you have to get ahead don't just accept a job sweeping the street you know if you so if you work hard and study you know you'll you'll make it no matter what and it just didn't and then there were this series of setbacks and and then in some cases you know him making a kind of these statements um and being when i first someone when i first heard the anecdote about the lynching i just thought i i don't believe that i'm not i'm really skeptical about that and then it was just by reading the oregonian week by week for you know through the 1860s i finally came across this really poorly reproduced clipping and there was a clipping that had the account of him at the lynching and i just thought wow you know um, that, that's quite interesting and, and um, disappointing at the same time, but also helps you sort of appreciate the complexity of the individual. And th there were many forces at work at the time. His choice to, um, if indeed he did, and I think that he probably did adopt a strategy of passing. Um, I'm sure some might be disappointed at that too, but you know, that, I mean, it's one of the basic questions and it's fascinating to me. How could a black man succeed on Front Street in the 1850s during the age of exclusion? Here's how we did it. Yeah. Well, I think you have for us um, a few photographs that show the Francis Building and its vicinity in Portland during that time period. So maybe we'll end on that, showing the, the place that you were just talking about where he survived on Front Street. Thanks, sure. Sarah, for- um, Yeah, kind of the idea here was that, you know, without a portrait of him, we don't know what he looks like, but we can look at both his fellows and then you know contemporaries and then also images of Portland when he was here. So I like this image of, of uh, Portland by Grafton T. Brown, who is an um, African-American uh, engraver who came up in 1863 and did this view of Portland with a camera lucida. So it's a highly accurate 
kind of projection onto a piece of drawing paper that then he traced. And you can see right in the center of it, right above the middle steamboat, you can see there's a steamboat tied up uh, to the dock and then a low ramp up there. That's where Francis's store was in those hotels that I showed you before. And then the white areas to the right and to the left on the shoreline, those are the, the remains of the levee, the pu formerly public ground that was in sort of usurped by Lounsdale and others and they just decided to build on it and it had been open and regarded as a public space. Um, for a number of years. So uh, the next one is um, a great photo courtesy of Ran uh, Randy Trowbridge that uh, probably about 1860, I'm gonna guess now because the building there on the lower left, but this is from the Canton house looking to the north on Front Street at Stark. So that building there on the lower left with the windows in it, that's the Francis store at the time that he occupied it. So it's really quite a remarkable photo. Um, the frame building behind it there, the white one burned in 1861. So we know this photo is before 1861. Uh, great, great photo and the trees sort of drawn in. Um, next slide is of the uh, almost the same exact view, the famous, that 1860 view uh, is in the Portland Art Museum collection. And it's a, uh, was taken by Joseph Bucktoll, the pioneer photographer of Oregon. But here's the same scene exactly looking in the same direction from, Wash from uh, Washington Street, north on front towards Stark. And the buildings are there, the, the Ladd building is still intact and the Francis store there in 1931. Um, and just to be able to walk down that street, I would probably give my left arm, but um, at that time. So next one is uh, the famous Ladd building there on the left, um, two doors up from the Francis store. Uh, Quite a remarkable structure and uh, caught the attention of Minor White, the uh, photographer who uh, started his career in Portland with the Works Progress Administration in 1938, took the photo there of the, uh, of the iron door and that was in his WPA portfolio. So on the next slide, uh, since we all love Minor White's photos of Portland, here's a great one you maybe never seen. It's from the Minor White archive at Princeton University Art Museum, and I recognized it uh, as the Francis store in 1939, sort of on looking east or, or looking west from front. And you can see the ground story, the building's been reskinned with a really ornate cast iron furnace architecture, uh, which uh, Bill Hawkins um, could tell us a lot more about in that whole process of how that worked. But it looks like the second story is still kind of the traditional brick, unreinforced masonry structure probably would have to be retrofitted if it was still there or if uh, uh, the um, Harbor Drive didn't get to it first. So next slide. So the process of erasing took many forms. And one of those was building things like uh, the Morrison Street bridge ramps, which by my estimate looks like it took out three entire city square blocks. And those buildings, some of those were still uh, there into the 1950s, the Francis building was torn down in 1940, but that's the site of the, of the Francis building there on the Southwest corner. And then uh, you can see what ultimately happened by uh, the late 1960s that just so much space was given over to the automobile. And that actually probably ties directly into these notions of, of how power is articulated in urban form. Um, is people had, the people who had the, the purse strings and and the, the, the authority um, essentially listened to the folks that wanted to drive through downtown faster or park. So um, next slide is a shout out to the plaque dedication uh, tomorrow at four. Um, we don't have this portrait, but we have several really nice examples of Abner's signature and, and Sidna's signature. That's from a mortgage. And I have to give a shout out um, to uh, the land title, the land survey title authority in uh, DC and one of their researchers, uh, Wendy Smith, who, who helped dig through. Up in Victoria, in BC, you can't just walk in and do research or do it remotely on land deeds. You have to get a, a licensed titled um, agent of, of this title authority. And it's a little bit complicated, but uh, we ended up really hitting pay dirt in that front. And so um, the, uh, the, the, um, 
the image or the likeness of Francis lives in a variety of forms. And so uh, NATO Parkway will have a, a representation of him starting tomorrow, which will be great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ken. And thank you, uh, Kimberly Moreland, for joining us and introducing today's talk as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for logging on and listening to the presentation. I hope you can join us and Oregon Black Pioneers and the Lang Syne Society tomorrow at 4 o'clock at Southwest NATO and Harvey Milk Street for the unveiling of the plaque. So we appreciate your work, and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.